So I guess all of my work really begins with the problem of consciousness. So I'm going to start by just trying to articulate how exactly I understand that. The word consciousness is a little bit of an ambiguous word. Sometimes it's used to mean something quite sophisticated like self-consciousness or awareness of self. Um, and this is the kind of thing we might be a little reluctant to attribute to many non-human animals, like a rabbit, for example. You know, does, certainly a rabbit has some experience of the world, but do, is it a w reflectively aware of its own existence? Maybe not. But the way I use the word consciousness, the w just the way it's generally used in contemporary philosophy, it's mu something much more simple, in a way. Uh, it simply means experience. So pleasure, pain, visual and auditory experiences, itchy sensations. These are all forms of experience or consciousness. So there's a very famous way of defining it from the philosopher Thomas Nagel. So according to Nagel, something is conscious just in case there's something that it's like to be it. So if you contrast a rabbit with a table, there's something that it's like for a rabbit to be cold or to be kicked or to have a knife stuck in it. In contrast, there's nothing that it's like, or so we ordinarily suppose, for a table to be cold or to be kicked or to have a knife stuck in it. There's nothing that it's like from the inside, as it were, to be a table. So this is just trying to clarify the idea. This is what we mean by consciousness. It's simply the property of having experience or having an inner life of some kind or other. And the problem of consciousness is quite simply, why does consciousness exist? So despite advances in your neuroscientific understanding of the brain, particularly in the last 80 years, we still have, in my view, absolutely no good explanation of why brains produce consciousness. Yeah, so contrast in, in other areas of science, we have good explanations of why water boils at 100 degrees or why methane is flammable. You know, if you look at the underlying chemistry, you get a satisfying explanation of these things. But in terms of neuroscience, you know, we, we have good understanding of how neurons work and the chemistry of neurotransmitters and um, how the brain processes information and how the brain negotiates between environmental stimulus and behavioral responses. We have good understanding of many of these things, but none of it seems to shed any light on why there is this inner subjective world of feelings and thoughts and sensations. Indeed, it seems that, on the face of it at least, all of that information processing and behavioural functioning could have gone on in the complete absence of experience. At least that's how it seems. And so we're led back to the, conscious, the, the, led back to the question, why, why does consciousness exist at all? OK, so one very common response is to say, OK, look, there is a problem here, but neuroscience is going to solve it. And an, an argument that's very often made um, is, this, is something like the following. Well, if you, you, know, you look to the track record of physical science in explaining more and more of our universe, this ought to give us great confidence that if we just continue with our standard methods of investigating the brain, eventually we'll crack the problem of consciousness. So um, I call this neurofundamentalism because <laughs> it's meant to be provocative, I guess. It's very often comes, not always, but very often comes along with a kind of scorning of, of any approach that sort of deviates from this very narrow approach. So, uh, so this is Patricia Churchland, a very, very great philosopher and a very ardent proponent of this kind of approach. And Neil Seth is another interesting philosopher who makes this kind of argument. So I want to make a couple of responses to this, but one thing I want to say is I'm a huge fan of neuroscience, so I want to emphasise that, and I think neuroscience is absolutely crucial to making progress on consciousness. The only argument I would want to make is that neuroscience alone, I don't believe, can solve the problem of consciousness. So a couple of responses to this neurofundamentalist -fund position. Firstly, I think that, that it often depends on a kind of oversimplification of science, as though it's always just a matter of doing the experiments and getting the data. Whereas very often, you know, great moments of progress in science involve reimagining the world. So if you think of the, you know, the, the leap of the imagination of Newton hypothesizing that the same force that pulls apples to the ground is the same force that keeps the, the moon in orbit around the Earth. 
or the, uh, the move in Minkowski's interpretation of special relativity from thinking of space and time as separate entities to thinking them as aspects of a single unified thing, space-time. Or the, you know, the radical proposal in general relativity that gravity somehow emerges from the curvature of space-time. I mean, these kind of great moments of scientific progress it, this involve this kind of radical rethinking, reconceptualization of our picture of the universe. Um, now, you might say, you know, these were ultimately tested <laughs> with observation, experiment, and of course that's true. But still, uh, my only point is, I think if you have too much of a focus on observation and experiment, you ignore the role that deep thought has always played in scientific progress. And I have a hunch, given the, the intractability of this problem, that it's going to be re not only neuroscience, but reconceptualizing our, how we think about the brain and how we think about the mind and perhaps the relationship between them that is ultimately going to help us make progress on consciousness. But secondly, more fundamentally, I think the neurofundamentalists draw the wrong inference from the success of physical science. So they want to say, look, science has gone so well. This should give us confidence that one day it will solve the problem of consciousness. I should say physical science. I want to distinguish, you know, what the hell is science? Physical science. I want to say, though, actually, that physical science has done so well precisely because it was never designed to deal with consciousness. So this is what I want to tell you about now, starting with this guy. So Galileo kickstarts the scientific revolution by declaring that mathematics was to be the language of science. There's a very famous poetic quote, philosophy, by which he meant natural philosophy or natural science, is written in this grand book, The Universe. So he's thinking of the universe as a book which stands continuously open to our gaze, but it cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and read the letters in which it's composed. It is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles and other geometrical figures, without which it's humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. Without these, one wanders in a dark labyrinth. Great quote. So this is a very well-known uh, move. What is often ignored, at least in popular discourse, is the philosophical theorizing that lay behind Galileo's mathematizing of nature, right? It wasn't just a matter of saying, I know, let's do maths, let's do science with maths, right? There was a problem when Galileo wanted to do this. And the problem was that before Galileo, people quite naturally took, took it that the world is full of sensory qualities colors, sounds, smells, tastes. So people thought, you know, the spiciness of the paprika is really in the paprika. Or the, uh, the smell of the flowers is really in the flowers or in the air surrounding the flowers. And the colors are really on the surfaces of objects. But the problem is it's hard to see how you can capture these kind of qualities in the purely quantitative language of mathematics. Hard to see how you can capture in an equation what it's like to taste paprika or see red. So this was a stumbling block for Galileo. You know, if, how can he, if he wants m mathematics to describe the physical world, what do we do about these qualities that we can't seem to capture in mathematical language? So Galileo answered this challenge with a philosophical theory. Galileo, well, in a way, with a reimagining of, of, of our picture of the universe. So according to Galileo's reimagining, the sensory qualities aren't really out there in the world. They're just in the soul of the perceiver. So here's someone, well, <laughs> it's a skull, but anyway, here's someone looking at a table and the, their, their soul is represented by this thought bubble. So according to Galileo, the, the, you know, the color and the feel and the smell of the table, that's not really in the table. That's just in the soul of the perceiver. The only things that are in the table are things like shape, size, length, breadth, width. And what's distinctive about those kind of properties is that they can be captured in the purely quantitative language of mathematics. So we have a picture of the universe now that can be completely captured in mathematical geometry, right? Um, and this is the birth of mathematical physics. So the crucial point is Galileo, at least, never intended physical science to be a complete picture of reality. 
He thought that it could, it could describe the quantitative properties of the physical world, but he thought it couldn't capture uh, the sensory qualities which he took to be forms of consciousness in the soul. Okay, so, um, so what do we learn from this? Well, I think this leads to a quite distinctive, I mean, this is my, what I think we should learn about the hi from the history of physical science. So physical science has done incredibly well, but it's done incredibly well since Galileo set the sensory qualities outside of its domain of inquiry. And so I think this gives us absolutely no reason to think that physical science could deal adequately with the sensory qualities themselves. That was not what it was designed for. So I have an analogy in my book, um, at least in the UK, when you're a lecturer or a professor, there are three duties, research, teaching and administration. And in my first, my first term as a lecturer or assistant professor, uh, my head of department very kindly let me off administration for a term so I could just focus on teaching and research. And I did pretty well at the job, right? That doesn't give you any reason to think I'd be good at administration, right? I did very well precisely because I didn't have to deal with administration, right? And in fact, when administration came back in, it was a different story. But so in, analogously, I would say physical science has done so well precisely because Galileo says, just don't worry about the sensory qualities. Just focus on what you can capture in mathematical language. This gives us no reason to think that physical science is adequately equipped to deal with the sensory qualities. But that's precisely what we need of a theory of consciousness. So even if Galileo is right that the, the sensory qualities aren't really out there in the, in the physical world, they're certainly present in our experience. You know, your, your experience right now is characterized by colors and smells and sounds. Um, consciousness is a quality rich phenomenon and so if we want a theory of consciousness it's got to be able to account for those qualities. Therefore I think the track record of physical science, great as it is, gives us absolutely no grounds for thinking that there will one day be a physical, a purely physical explanation of consciousness. Um, moreover I ultimately think, although I'm not going to argue this here, that there are actually very powerful philosophical arguments that do demonstrate that Galileo was perfectly right all along, that the purely quantitative language of physical science just isn't, a, can't characterize the qualities of experience. So that's, that's basically what I do at length in the first half of the book, although I'm not going to rehearse those arguments here. Um, okay, so where, where do we go from here? So the consciousness, I mean, the problem because is often presented as a, we've got a choice between two radically opposed theories. One, physicalism, roughly the view that consciousness can be explained in terms of physical processes in the brain. Two, dualism, that consciousness is a property of the non-physical soul. And both of these problems, both of these theories have very profound difficulties. So as we've just been discussing, the problem with physicalism is that it's hard to see how it can account for the qualities of experience in the kind of quantitative language of physical science. The familiar problem with dualism is that it has difficulty accounting for mind-body interaction. So most dualists, even though they think the mind is separate from the brain, they want to say there's a close causal relationship. So, you know, your decision to raise your arm in the mind causes your arm to go up or your your thoughts cause your lips to move as you speak. And in the other direction, light and vibrations from the world impacting on the body cause vision, in some sense cause visual and auditory experiences in the soul. So there's a close interaction there. And there's famous difficulties, we might touch on a little bit later about how, to, how the Judas can make sense of this. So we have this perennial debate that goes on and on, which to my mind is always a fight about the least worst option. <laughs> Neither of these views are attractive and we just go back and forth. Fortunately, there is now another option, which, uh, which um, well, before me, Gerdehardt and others were promoting and is now coming more to the fore. So recently rediscovered ideas of Bertrand Russell and Arthur Eddington, who's incidentally the first scientist to confirm general relativity. He's also a, a keen philosophy enthusiast. 
from the 1920s have led to a view that promises to avoid both the problems facing physicalism and the problems facing dualism. So this is the view that's become known as Rosellian monism. I think that might be better to get a, not a catchier term, but anyway, that's, that's what we've got at the moment. Um, so I, I kind of think it's a tragedy of history that I think, you know, between the two great wars of the 20th century, I think these guys did for conscious, the science of consciousness what Darwin did for the science of life. I mean, I think they essentially gave us the solution. But then perhaps with the Great Depression, the Second World War, the anti-philosophy zeitgeist, I think, of the post-war years, at least in Anglo-Saxon philosophy, um, this kind of got forgotten about. But it's recently been rediscovered. Well, Gerda Hart was a pioneer of this. I mean, there were people in the 20th century talking about this, but it's really come more of a fore to the fore at the moment, uh, of late. And what I try to do in the second half of my book is really bring together and critically evaluate a lot of the recent literature. There's been a huge number of articles published on this, and, um, and I ultimately defend my own form of it. Okay, so, so the, the next thing I want to try and explain to you, what is, what is this Rossellian monism all about? Okay, we're making good time. Um, so the starting point, let me just get some water. The starting point is this idea Russell and Eddington had that physics t physical science tells you a lot less than you think about the nature of matter. So I think in the popular mind, physics is on its way to giving us this complete story of the nature of space and time and matter. Um, but what, what, what Russell and Eddington realized is that the mathematical nature of physical science instituted by Galileo means that physic, physical science can't really even tell us what physical properties are. Physical science doesn't really tell us what physical properties are. So what does this mean? So here's an equation, Newton's law of universal gravitation. So the F is, stands for force, G for the gravitational constant, M1 and M2 are the masses of two objects. We're thinking about the gravitational attraction between, and then R is the distance between them. So, um, so notice that this equation doesn't tell you what these properties are, force and mass and distance. I mean, it doesn't, as it were, it doesn't give you a, de a definition. You know, if you want to know what something is, you ask for a definition. You say, you know, what's the European Union? Someone will say, oh, well, it's this uh, political and economic union of 28 countries, mostly in Europe. Okay, I know what the European Union is. This equation doesn't give you a definition of what mass is. It, as it were, assumes you already know what it is, what these properties are, and then it asserts a mathematical relationship between them. And in fact, if you try to extract a definition of any physical property from physics, you'll quickly find yourself led back in a circle. So say, you know, say we want to know what, what mass is. So what is mass in physics? We say, Physics characterizes mass in terms of gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. So you say, okay, well, so I need to know what, what gravitational attraction is. You say, okay, it's a kind of force that uh, all things being equal reduces the distance between things. Okay, so now we're into distance, we're into spatial temporal notion, spatial notion like distance. So what does physics tell us about spatial notions or spatial temporal notions? Well, again, you'll get other, other equations that relate spatio-temporal properties to physical properties like mass, charge, spin, force. So we, we're quickly led back in a circle um, and our attempt at clarification gets nowhere. So I think, I mean, I think what this tells us is not that physics is a load of rubbish, but that physics is just not in the business of telling us what physical properties are. It, it as it were, assumes a grip on them and then states mathematical relationships between them. So I actually changed exactly how I put this to how I put it in the book, but okay, so, so what this is undermining really is what I call the mirror of reality picture of physics, as though physics is sort of holding up a mirror to reality. So Russell Edgington said that's not really what it's doing. So, so what is it doing if it's not holding up a mirror to reality? Well, as I interpret Eddington, 
His claim is physics is not an, a mirror of reality, it's a tool for prediction. So even if we don't know the nature of physical properties, what they are, what a definition would give you, we're able to recognize them, right? So I don't, maybe I don't know what distance is, but I know that the distance between my hands is just reduced. So we can recognize force, we can recognize attraction. And because we can do that, we get our equations, we, can predict, we plug them in, we can predict what's going to happen. And as physics has progressed, we, this is our capacity to predict nature has, has uh, grown considerably, right? And once you have a great capacity to predict the behavior of nature, of physical nature, then you're able to manipulate it, leading to great technology and the wonderful technological transformation we find in our society. So this is all great, you know, this has been a very successful project. And you, you know, you lead to a feeling, oh, it's, it's telling us everything. But none of this gives us any reason to think that physical science is telling us the nature of physical properties. In fact, it's, it's successful precisely because that's not what it's in the business of. So I mean, Stephen Hawking, in, in his bestseller, The Brief History of Time, captures something like this point with this great line, physics doesn't tell us what breathes fire into the equations. Okay, so, what it, so there is this gap in physics, right? For all its virtues, we don't really know what physical properties are. So what does this have to do with consciousness? Well, if there's a gap in physics, then there's a corresponding gap in neuroscience, because neuroscience defines uh, brain states in terms of their chemical properties, and chemistry in turn defines chemical properties in terms of physics. Uh, so if physics doesn't tell us what physical properties are, then neuroscience doesn't tell us what brain states are. So we've got this huge gap in our neuroscientific understanding of the brain. Eddington's insight is, well, let's fill it with consciousness, right? This is the whole problem. We don't have, we don't, we're looking for a place for consciousness. Well, we've got this huge gap. We've got this place. Uh, so the Rossili and Moniz proposal is quite simply that conscious states are the real nature of brain states. So let's just try and make that clear with an example. W one of the important tasks of neuroscience is to correlate brain states and conscious states. So, you know, to work out, you know, when, when such and such is going on in the brain, um, people feel or experience such and such or vice versa. There's a, there's a tradition that's emerged from Saul Kripke in philosophy of giving the example of pain and C-fibers firing, as though these are correlated. Every, whenever you get C-fibers firing in the brain, you get pain and vice versa. It's actually empirically false, but I don't know, there's sort of this tradition emerged that we just pretend this is true for the sake of these. I guess because all the more empirically accurate examples get kind of complicated and controversial. So this is just, imagine for the sake of illustration that neuroscience has told us that C fibers firing in the brain and pain, the feeling of pain, they always go together. You know, whenever you have that in the brain, people feel pain and vice versa. Well, according to Russellian monism, then on the basis of that, the feeling of pain is the real nature of C-fibers firing. So you've got this thing, this property that neuroscience points at and characterizes in terms of its role in the brain, but neuroscience doesn't tell you what that property is in itself. The Rosili Monis says, that property in itself is the feeling of hunger. So neuroscience describes, there's one thing that neuroscience describes extrinsically in terms of what it does, but in itself, that thing just is the feeling of pain. So this is a way of bringing the reality of consciousness and our physical understanding of the universe together in a unified picture of reality. So this is great. Uh, I think this gives us a view that avoids all the problems of physicalism and all the problems of dualism, right? So we don't have to explain the qualities of consciousness in terms of the, quantitative, quanti in terms of the quantitative language of physical science. In fact, it's kind of the other way around, at least in terms of the brain. The, the, the quantitative properties revealed by neuroscience are realized at least in part by the qualities of consciousness. And it avoids the problems of dualism, right? Because conscious states just are the real nature of brain states. So there's no interaction problem. We haven't got two things interacting. So this is great. So I think this is the essential insight of kind of Russell, but Eddington develops it a little bit. 
that really solves, to my mind, essentially solves the problem of consciousness by finding us a place for consciousness in the physical workings of the world. Okay, so what does this, what does this, that's the kind of essence of the view. What does this tell us about the nature of the universe more generally, getting more ambitious? So we've started from this gap in physics. Physical science doesn't tell us uh, the nature of matter, and then we, we inferred a gap in neuroscience. Rossini monism, as I've just described it, closes the gap in neuroscience. It says, you know, consciousness is the intrinsic nature of brain states. The nature of the brain is at least in part, according to Rossini and monism, constituted of consciousness. It's literally constituted of consciousness. But now there's a problem. So, but, you know, but what about the nature of matter outside of brains? What about the nature of fundamental physical properties like mass and spin and charge? It's natural to be curious about that. What can we do about this? We have no direct access to the nature of physical properties outside of brains. We only know the nature of the physical reality within our own brain, if, as the Rossilian monist thinks, it is quite literally the consciousness of our, we are immediately aware of. But what we can do is we can speculate based on what we do know, the reality of our own conscious experience. So here's a great quote from Eddington that kind of expresses this. Uh, we, are quaint, we are acquainted with an external world because it's for only because, but he doesn't say only. Okay, we are acquainted with an external world because its fibers run into our own consciousness. Oh, there's the only. It is only our own fibers that we actually know. From these ends, we must more or less successfully reconstruct the rest as a paleontologist reconstructs an extinct monster from its footprint. Quite nice. So yeah, so all, our, one in, our one glimpse on the, the nature, the, the real nature of physical reality is, well, we know the stuff in our own brains to some extent, and we see what we can do from there. So I argue in my book that from this basis, once we are Rossilian monists, we have strong reasons to accept the probable truth of something like panpsychism. So panpsychism, very roughly the view that all matter has a consciousness involving nature. <coughs> so as Gerhard said, this is a much maligned view, kind of treated as a bit of a joke uh, in 20th century, late 20th, latter half of the 20th century, still to this day to an extent. Um, it, treated as a joke insofar as it was thought about at all. But I think it's, it's starting to get taken a little, a little bit more seriously um, because it's a it's a natural extension of Rossilian monism, and Rossilian monism is getting taken more seriously. So, my argument for this, there are different... Um, I mean, I think the starting point is you've, you've really got to absorb the epistemological starting point of Rossilian monism, which is unusual and takes a while to absorb. So the starting point is that the only thing we know about the nature of matter is that some of it, that is to say, the stuff in brains, has a consciousness involving nat nature. So this is radically different to how we normally think about things. We have this idea that physical science is giving us this picture of the universe, it's telling us what the universe is like. Um, um, it's, it's, it's hard to get used to this idea. No, the only, the only thing we really know about the nature of matter is that some of it, the stuff in brains, has a consciousness involving nature. So I argue that from this starting point, who knows what's true for certain, but from this starting point, the most simple, elegant and parsimonious speculation is that the nature of matter outside of brains is continuous with the nature of matter inside of brains in also having a consciousness involving nature, right? So you'd need a reason. We know there's this consciousness stuff in the brain, no idea about the stuff out there. You'd need a reason to think the stuff out there was different to the stuff in here. You might think, that's, that's not, where's the evidence? That's not a very powerful consideration. But I, I try to argue, we could maybe talk about this more in discussion, that actually these kind of simplicity considerations are absolutely fundamental to how we do science. Um, you know, you, you can't do science you, just by looking at the data, in most cases in physics at least, because there's always an infinite number of hypotheses that are consistent with the data. And you choose between them on the basis of theoretical virtues like simplicity, elegance, parsimony. You try to find the simplest hypothesis that's consistent with the data. 
And that's exactly what, I, what I'm proposing here. I think the most simple <coughs> hypothesis consistent with the data, panpsychism is the most simple hypothesis consistent with uh, the starting point data of the Rossellian monist. So there's an argument for Rossellian monism, and then from that basis, we've got strong simplicity-based support for panpsychism. So I think, you know, actually, this can be argued to have as much support as many scientific theories. I, I make the comparison to special relativity that's justified on the basis of simplicity over its Lorentzian rival. And I don't see why the, the, this case here is any weaker than that. OK, so we could talk more about that. So actually, I'm not, I'm not helping the cause, am I, with these mystical pictures? I should try, try to get panpsychism <laughs> taken seriously. But then you Google image panpsychism and you get these. Anyway, it's kind of fun. I kind of like that one. Um, OK, so panpsychism kind of comes in, in, in two forms. Perhaps more standard is what we might call micropsychism, uh, the view that, that the most basic micro-level constituents of the physical world, uh, perhaps electrons or quarks, have a consciousness involving nature, and then the consciousness of the human or animal brain is somehow derived from the consciousness of its most fundamental parts. So the micropsychist doesn't think, you know, it's important <coughs> not to caricature, they don't think electrons as sort of have complicated thoughts or are feeling existential angst. The idea would be that they have some unimaginably simple form of experience. And then the very complicated experience of, a, of an animal brain is somehow the, derived from the combination of those trillions and trillions of uh, very simple consciousness-involving entities. Um, but the, 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 uh, the, the form of panpsychism I ultimately defend in the book is a little bit different. So there's, there have been a number of philosophers uh, so, so I guess micropsychism shares this assumption quite naturally, like a lot of philosophers, that fundamental things are really small. So it's a sort of Lego brick picture of the world. You've got all these little things, you put them together, you make big things. Um, but as a lot of philosophers, particularly uh, Jonathan Schaffer, uh, rejecting this kind of position. So, so the, the position Schaffer defends that he calls priority monism is sort of the complete inverse of this. So instead of thinking of uh, smaller things as more fundamental than bigger things, Schaffer argues that bigger things are more fundamental than smaller things. Uh, the smaller things exist and are the way they are because the bigger things exist and are the way they are. And ultimately, everything exists and is the way it is because of the, the biggest thing, namely the universe. The universe is the one utterly fundamental thing. Um, so he's not interested in panpsychism at all or defending God on that basis. Well, one of the more powerful arguments he gives, I think, is he thinks that the phenomenon of quantum entanglement fits better with this kind of picture of the universe, uh, the priority monist picture, not the panpsychist picture, uh, than uh, the more familiar micro-based view. But anyway, I don't want to go into that right now. If you combine Schaffer-style priority monism with panpsychism, you get Cosmopsychism, the, vo the view that the universe as a whole is conscious and the consciousness of the human animal brain is somehow derived from the consciousness of the cosmos. So the final thing I want to do is consider what is probably generally understood to be the most serious objection to the kind of panpsychist picture I've just been trying to advocate. The so-called the dreaded combination problem, this is a term from Bill Seeger. Uh, yeah, roughly the idea is, well, just starting with thinking about the micropsychist picture, but roughly the idea is how exactly is human animal consciousness derived from the consciousness of micro-level parts? So the idea is, you know, how is it that these little conscious things combine to make a big conscious thing like the human brain? It's sort of difficult to make sense of. We can understand how Lego bricks make a tower, but how do little minds make a big mind? Um, seems almost unintelligible. There are different ways of cashing this out into a more concrete argument or difficulty. The way I've um, defended it in, in the book, well, one of the ways actually, um, and in other articles, is as a sort of apparent failure of entailment. It's postulating, the idea would be postulating experience to the smallest parts of the brain 
doesn't seem to entail that the brain as a whole has experience. So maybe a way to think about this, um, think about a kind of weird Martian robot that's not itself conscious in the sense that you know, the brain of the robot or the robot as a whole doesn't have experience, but it, the fundamental particles it's made up of are conscious. So that seems, that seems consistent, right? It seems consistent there could be something that's not conscious, but it's little bits of conscious. It's made up of conscious things. Um, that seems logically consistent. And in that case, it seems like, well, facts about consciousness at the micro level don't need to have any bearing <coughs> on whether or not the macro level is conscious. So it seems like facts about whether the bits of my brain are conscious don't have any bearing on whether my brain as a whole is conscious. And then, well, then it's hard to say, well, how on earth could we explain my consciousness in terms of the consciousness of the bits of my brain? Um, so this is something, something I initially introduced, at least in that explicit form. It's probably already there and sort of implicitly. Uh, in an article in 2009, before my conversion to panpsychism, and, um, and then I've spent the rest of the time since then trying to solve it. So, so I saw my career is kind of making a problem for myself and then trying to solve it. Anyway, okay, so this is a great difficulty, and I want to finish by just raising three possible solutions. First response is not really a solution, but a rejection of the idea that panpsychists should have an answer to this already. Because a lot of people have this approach, well, panpsychism has this combination problem, so we shouldn't waste more time thinking about it. It's obviously dead in the water. But you know, my response is, we've spent many decades now, <laughs> at least, trying to explain human consciousness in terms of physical properties. The brain, and I would argue, got precisely nowhere. We've, we've We've, got, we've, got, we've made a lot of progress in lots of things to do with consciousness, but that specific problem, I would argue, uh, we've got nowhere. But we've spent almost no time uh, trying to explain human consciousness in terms of more basic forms of consciousness. This is an alternative research program. Um, so to my mind, the idea of rejecting panpsychism because of the combination problem is a little bit like when Darwin first comes up with natural selection saying, well, you haven't explained how the eye evolves, so I'm not going to waste any time thinking about your view. Um, so I, I hope, you know, from, I would argue from the kind of considerations I've said today, this is a view we've got really serious, you know, people think it's always a kind of joke and stuff, it sounds a bit silly, but I really think this is a view we've got very serious reason to take uh, very seriously indeed. And it has problems, but it could be that further inquiry helps deal with these problems. And there are a lot of very interesting proposals from a lot of uh, young people working on this issue. OK, second option defended by uh, this esteemed philosopher, Gerhard Brunschrip. OK, so the proposal here is roughly, the emergent disposal will be roughly uh, that there are basic laws, just basic principles of nature connecting micro-level consciousness to macro-level consciousness. Well, maybe this is different to exactly how Gerhard thinks of it, actually. But um, anyway, this is one way of thinking about emergentism. So that, you know, I presented the combination problem as a failure of entailment. The emergentists would say, well, yeah, if you just got the micro-level facts, you've got a failure of entailment. But um, uh, once we bring in the, these basic principles that get us from the micro to macro, then we get the entailment. OK. I think there is a fairly widespread view that this leads to um, the kind of problems of causation that the dualist suffers from. So I think a, a lot of philosophers are persuaded that the physical world forms a causally closed system in the sense that anything, any physical event has a completely physical cause. Um, and if that's right, the worry is, well, these emergent properties of human consciousness that sort of pop up, there's going to be no room for them to, to cause anything in the physical world because they're going to be, as it were, locked out of this causally closed physical system. Um, OK, so this is, this is a worry. Um, this is the worry kind of that many people make to dualism. This is going a little bit beyond what I say in the book, but I think we need to sharply distinguish two, two kinds of causal closure. 
physical causal closure, which is the view that ev every physical event has a physical cause, and microphysical causal closure, that every physical event has a cause at the micro level. So I think the former is quite consistent with this view, the latter not. So the former, you know, the, the emergentist can say, sure, the physical world is causally closed because conscious states are the real nature of brain states. So they're part of that causally closed system. There's no interaction problem. But it's inconsistent with micro-level causal closure. If everything, if everything that happens has a, you know, if all my behavior can be traced back to micro-level causes, then there's no room for this emergent human consciousness to play a role in shaping my behavior. It's locked out of the causally closest. So that's the idea. We've got uh, the emergentists think there's these, these brand new properties of human consciousness pop up at the, at the macro level. But if the micro level is causally closed, there doesn't seem anything left for them to do in you know, shaping behavior. Um, so, so the question about whether this plausible would depend on whether we've got reason to believe not just physical causal closure, but microphysical causal closure. So I'm thinking recently, partly in playing this talk, that I mean, I kind of accept both. I'm kind of slightly agnostic, but in the book I tentatively accept both. But I'm now more thinking that we do have strong reason to accept physical causal closure, but not micro-level causal closure. So why physical causal closure? So it seems to me that suppose dualism was true, and you know, the soul, the non-physical mind, is interacting with the brain all the time, right? That seems to, you know, when you talk, when you move, it seems to me that would really show up in neuroscience. There would be all sorts of things happening in the brain that had no physical cause. It'd be like a poltergeist playing with the brain. They'd be all kind of gappy. But what about micro-level causal closure? Do we have reason, do we have empirical reason to think that some part of the brain, the cerebellum or something, its causal powers are completely determined by the causal powers of its most fundamental parts? I'm not sure. Does it, what would that look like if it was true, if it wasn't true? I've at least never heard a really powerful empirical defense of that. Um, I'm very much open to persuasion all sides of this debate actually, but it's not clear to me. So if, if we don't have strong reason to believe micro, it's often sort of just a, asserted in philosophy articles and then people deduce the implications, but it, you rarely get a good, a good defense of it. Uh, probably the best is by David Papineau in his paper, The Rise of Physicalism, but still, I don't think we get as much empirical meat as I, I would like, so anyway. So if we don't have a reason to accept uh, microlevel causal closure, then that problem goes away. Another advantage we talked about in the seminar today that I'm just starting to think about, I might be completely wrong, is this, um, is that if there are, fun, as the emergentist thinks, fundamental properties associated with human consciousness, then we can perhaps adopt a face value interpretation of quantum mechanics. So, um, so the big problem in quantum mechanics, or one, of, one of the big problems, the so-called measurement problem, that it seems like measurement or observation makes a difference to the causal evolution of the, of, the, of the physical world. So when things are not being measured, the Schrodinger equation governs and things are in superpositions, then when things are measured or observed, the wave function collapses, as they say, and we get determinate observations. And the worry is, you know, how can measurement or observation be playing a fundamental role in physics. It seems like only fundamental properties play a role in fundamental physics, and observation seems like a very human property. It doesn't seem like a fundamental property. But of course, if you're an emergentist, you can say, in a sense, observation is a fundamental property or closely related fundamental property. So if we define observation or measurement as interaction with uh, human consciousness or higher level consciousness, then that's a relationship with a fundamental property because human consciousness is a fundamental property. Um, so we might even take quantum mechanics on the face of it as evidence for a kind of emergentism. We need fundamental properties associated with human consciousness. So I'm building really on recent work, not yet written up. You can watch talks on YouTube, David Chalmers and Kelvin McQueen defending something like this old idea that's never always been kind of ridiculed, never really made rigorous and given a fair chance.
of consciousness collapsing the wave function. And they say, well, this is inconsistent with panpsychism because, you know, panpsychism is you've got consciousness everywhere, so the wave function would always collapse and you'd never get superpositions. My thought, and I still need to think about this more, is, well, maybe, we, maybe it's higher level consciousness, emergent consciousness, that collapses the wave function. But anyway, one possibility. Finally, another view on the table, I think, is a mysterious, mysterism, my, my, myster, mysterianism uh, proposal. This is a word from... Um, Colin McGinn is the, the, the original person, but the person who, Flanagan, I think, uh, came up with that term, named after a pop band, the New Mysterians. Um, anyway, um, okay, so the idea would be here, you know, why, why do we have this failure of entailment? Well, there is some, the claim would be that there is some, or we have reason to think there's some element involved in the derivation from fundamental consciousness to human consciousness that we have no epistemological access to. So I explore in the book the possibility of this with spatial relations. Um, I should say briefly, there's, I didn't say, you know, I've just been thinking the, the microbase version. I think these worries apply equally to the cosmopsychist version. You know, it also seems that postulating consciousness at the level of the universe doesn't seem to obviously entail any facts about any part of the universe being conscious. So we similarly have an entailment problem. Okay, so I explore maybe that the solution in the coming back again to the micro, the micro-based uh, micropsychism, spatial relations might be uh, a possibility here. So presumably, spatial relations are important for mental combination. Um, you know, if we, you know, it's natural to think things can't combine unless they're spatially related to each other in quite specific ways. But physical science does not tell us what spatial relations are. So it's part of the more general thesis that physical science doesn't tell us what physical properties are. And spatial relations are a kind of physical property, a relational property. So, so it could be that we fail to see the entailment from micro-consciousness to macro-human consciousness because we have no grasp of the real nature of spatial relations. So as it were, when God... <laughs> just to take a theological metaphor, when God looks at the, uh, you know, the micro-level facts, she sees the, the micro-level consciousness and the real nature of spatial relations, and, and for God, there's, she sees the entailment. But we're just getting one part of the, uh, of the, of the, of the base here. We're, we're missing these spatial relations, and that's why we don't see the entailment. Okay, that's one proposal. There could be other proposals about what the element is we're missing. Now, you might think this is a bit of a cop-out, that it's um, not very satisfying, at least, you know, that, um, you know, the answer is sort of that there's a solution there, but we don't know what it is, almost. But I think we should, you know, we should be trying to look for not what theories are most satisfying, but what theories, which theories are most likely to be true. And given that we have direct, or direct access to only one small part of physical reality, we shouldn't be surprised if we are missing certain crucial pieces of parts of the jigsaw of reality, as it were. You know, and in fact, I think we've got independent reason, nothing to do with the combination problem, for thinking we don't understand the real nature of spatial relationships. Um, I think we've been sort of lulled into a false sense of confidence by the success of physical science. We think, you know, this is incredible. We're getting everything. But in fact, if you accept this view that physical science is really just giving us is a tool for prediction, is not really telling us the nature of physical properties, then it's, it's much less clear that we do have the potential as naturally evolved human beings to really understand the fundamental nature of reality. Um, in fact, it, given that we're if you think we've evolved for survival rather than science, you might think it's more likely that we won't. Okay, so finally, try and bring things together. So re really what's driving everything for me is this question, how do we know the fundamental nature of reality? Conventional wisdom tells us we should look to physical science, but I would argue that there are two problems with this. A, physical science doesn't tell us the real nature of physical properties, and B, physical science cannot account for the reality of consciousness. So I think there are two sources of data we have for finding out what the world is like, observational and phenomenological. So obs the data of observation experiment, of course, very important, but also the datum that consciousness is a reality. 
the reality of that thing which each of us knows to exist with greater certainty than anything else. I think Descartes was completely right about at least that point. <clears throat> and I would argue that Rossellian panpsychism is the most simple, elegant theory of reality consistent with these data, and thus a theory we have overwhelming reason to believe. But finally, um, I want to say that point out that actually Rossellian monism is not a complete theory of reality. It's more a framework for understanding the universe and the place of consciousness within it, and it will require decades of serious interdisciplinary work between philosophers, physicists, neuroscientists to fill in the details. Um, but the problem is that although Rossellian monism is getting more known in academic philosophy, it's still almost completely unknown outside of philosophy and other branches of science amongst the general public. So this is part of, part of what I've been trying to do more recently is writing a lot of popular articles. I'm working on a popular book on these themes. So what I'm really trying to do is just get more and more people involved in this, in what I see as an interdisciplinary project. And I think a project that has the potential not only to give us a solution to the problem of consciousness, but also perhaps to is perhaps our best hope, is the best guess human beings are capable of, of trying to find out what reality is really like.